Good morning. Uh, I'm Eddie Bernice Johnson from the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, but we are in District 30 this morning with a number of eager students. We are delighted that you're there, Mr. Peake and Mr. Williams, and I'm going to turn it right over to the students so they can have the benefit of talking with you. We're delighted that you are engaging us this morning. We're very happy to talk to you, and we look forward to uh, your questions. Hi, gentlemen. I'm Tatiana Brown, and this question is for Jeff. How does being in space for such an extensive period of time affect your body, and what does your routine look like to maintain your health both in space and when you return to home? Well, without the force of gravity on our bodies and our muscles carrying our bodies, our muscles atrophy, of course. Our, our bones also atrophy. Bones need uh, exercise uh, to stay strong. Uh, and those are the two primary effects that we have on our bodies while we're up here. So we exercise every day. We have the, uh, a treadmill. We use a harness to pull us down into the treadmill to get a load. Uh, we have a cycle ergometer, so it's, it's very uh, similar to, to getting on a bicycle and getting exercise that way. We also have the equivalent of a weightlifting uh, piece of equipment where we can uh, lift heavy loads, and that's uh, one of the primary ways that we're able to keep our muscles and our bones strong. So when you return to Earth, do you have to do similar exercises? We go through a, a rehabilitation or a reconditioning program. Uh, it's typically 45 days, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, working with a trainer uh, to regain um, uh, our full strength and flexibility as well as our sense of balance. Balance is another thing that we have to regain once we get back. Thank you very much, sir. Hello, hello, gentlemen. My name is Steven Sanders. I go to Duncanville ISD. And I do want to, this question is going towards Tim. And Tim, I want to say I'm sorry in advance because I was reading William Shakespeare before I wrote this down. My question is, has living in outer space and conducting scientific experiments heightened and strengthened your appreciation for life? And if so, in what ways? <laughs> Stephen and uh, everyone else uh, Dallas. Uh, it's great to be talking to you today. Well, that's a very deep question to start things off with today. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's a good question. I don't think being in space has changed my appreciation for life. I think I had a, a very high appreciation of life um, before I started on this extraordinary journey. Um, but what it does give you being in space, it gives you different perspective. And looking down on the planet, um, seeing our atmosphere, seeing how thin and fragile that atmosphere is, and seeing the planet even change through the seasons just since I've been up here. And I've seen the northern hemisphere go from, from winter to spring and now into summer. And it gives you a very different perspective on the planet, and uh, it makes you appreciate uh, what, what a beautiful planet we have and how we have to look after it. Thank you, Tim. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Tyron Crittle from Lancaster High School. And my uh, question is for Jeff. Um, robotics, um, in my district, we have uh, robotics clubs for even uh, elementary students. How do how does studying robotics at an early age um, benefit going on missions like these? Well, I think studying things like robotics uh, certainly could benefit anybody that has an interest in that. And it sounds like you have an interest, so I would uh, encourage you to continue working in it. Robotics uh, is uh, a big part of life nowadays, and it's going to only grow in its importance with lots of different applications across uh, many disciplines. Uh, robotics is a unique problem. It combines a lot of technology. It combines mechanics. You, you have a problem you're trying to solve. And you use all those tools to, uh, to put a system together to solve the problem. So it's a great exercise just in solving, uh, problem solving. Uh, so I would certainly encourage you to continue that, especially if you have an interest in it. Uh, that interest, assuming you have it, uh, it needs to be fostered. And that's how we uh, learn uh, in our early years uh, what 
something we might want to uh, do for the rest of our life and dedicate uh, our life's purpose toward. Thank you. Hello, gentlemen. I'm Mariah Chavez from the Grand Prairie Collegiate Institute. And this question is for Tim. Could you please explain what your first experience in space was like? Yeah, what a great question. Uh, my first experience of space was one of euphoria uh, because it, it, it happened uh, sort of eight minutes, 48 seconds after launch when the, the main engines of the Soyuz, of the Soyuz third stage, cut out and you get a very big jolt forward in the seat when that happens. And that, that's at the point where you know that you're in space and uh, you're in uh, microgravity. And looking out the window, we were, we were looking into the orbit. Um, and looking out the window, I saw my first moon rise very soon after orbital insertion. And then, of course, shortly after that, I saw my first sunrise out of my Soyuz right-hand seat window. And it was just the most exhilarating feeling to uh, un unloosen your buckles, your harness, and to be able to float in your seat and to be able to look out on planet Earth as we made that very first orbit. For me, my very first orbit of planet Earth. Most exhilarating experience ever. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jordan Cheatham, and this question is for Jeff. How often does a cargo ship resupply the ISS, and are you allowed to make special requests as such as your favorite chocolate? Actually, we get cargo ships all six or eight or nine times a year of different types. Right now, we currently have four cargo ships uh, either docked or berthed to the space station. We've got two Russian cargo ships, uh, Progresses, and they have historically flown to about four times a year. Uh, we're going down to about three times a year for a Progress. We also have a uh, Cygnus. Uh, Orbital uh, Corporation has uh, provided that. Um, and that uh, flies a couple times a year. And then we have a Dragon supply ship, and that uh, flies a, a two or three times a year. Uh, we also uh, have had supply ships from uh, the Japanese Space Agency as well as the European Space Agency. Can we make special requests? Sure. We, uh, we get some, uh, some fresh food and vegetables, uh, fruits and vegetables, which is always a treat uh, because we don't get that uh, being up here. Uh, we have to eat it pretty quickly before it goes bad. Uh, and we also, believe it or not, on this last dragon, we got some ice cream set up for us, and we have that in the freezer, and we're enjoying that as we, uh, as we go over the couple weeks, I guess. Thank you. Hi, I'm Camden from Cedar Hill. Um, my question is for Tim, and my question is, is it hard to juggle your personal life with your professional life with such a busy profession? Camden, that's a, a good question to ask, and, and yes, it is hard. Uh, we spend a lot of time away, obviously not just the six months that we're on board the space station, but for the six years I was in training for this mission, I was probably away from home about 50% of the time. Um, but you know you know that when you uh, undertake this job, and it's, uh, it is a sacrifice that you make, but um, in terms of the privilege uh, of going into space, um, it's, it's really something that you do as a family, You're, and I'm very lucky, very fortunate that my family is incredibly supportive of what I do, and they understand the value and the benefit of uh, what we're all doing in the research for space exploration and human spaceflight. Um, so yes, there are sacrifices to be make, but made, but I think they're very much worth it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Enrique Loiza from the Grand Prairie Collegiate Institute. My question is for Jeff. Today. What do you feel has been your biggest accomplishment or breakthrough on your mission? Oh, I don't know if I've had a significant accomplishment or breakthrough on, on my mission. I would say that the, the, the biggest accomplishment and breakthrough is for the entire international team, the program in uh, assembling and building this magnificent orbital outpost we call the International Space Station. If you look at it historically, it was a, a really the, the biggest human achievement ever in history and continues to be just running and maintain it. Of course, it is an orbiting laboratory, so we're doing a lot of research across the whole disciplines of science. Um, and I could uh, spend a lot of time talking about 
uh, the research that's going on here and has gone on here over the last uh, 15 uh, plus years. Uh, but I would encourage you to uh, to spend some time on the on the website uh, doing that. But I would say the space station is the the biggest accomplishment of this uh, international team. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Estrella Via, and my question is for Tim. What's your most challenging? What's the most challenging part about being an astronaut? Wow, there are, there are several challenging things about being an astronaut. Um, for me, one of them in the early days was certainly learning the Russian language, as, as Jeff just mentioned there. You know, this is very much an international space station with an international crew. Um, and, uh, and speaking Russian uh, so that we can not just uh, work professionally with our Russian colleagues, but also be able to socialize with our Russian colleagues is very important. And uh, that's only a challenge. But I also think that uh, as a crew member on board the space station, you have to be a little bit of a jack of all trades and there are many trades you need to know. Obviously, we have a fantastic ground support team um, to help us out with all of the problems that we might encounter up here on the space station, but we need to try and retain as much information as we can to help us through our mission. And so I think that's also a challenge for astronauts is the, the retention of the, all the information as we go through our training. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kevin Maple, and this question is also for Tim. How can schools share ideas for experiments and other innovations to be considered on the space station? I think, uh, sorry, it was a bit broken, but I think the question was how can schools share the ideas for innovation and the experiments that are going on board the space station? Um, and as Jeff kind of pointed out earlier, there's, there's a fantastic amount of information on the website about the scientific research that we're doing up here on board the space station, but also the educational outreach programs that we have running. Uh, and there are many educational outreach programs running all the time. Some of them are based on fitness and nutrition. I've just finished two, uh, one on Mission X, which is an international program to get people involved in, uh, in healthy eating and a healthy way of life. Um, and also looking at research, for example, into growing fruits and vegetables on, the, on board the space station. So I would encourage anybody to to, to look online at these resources, and that's a wonderful way of getting in touch with other schools who might be doing similar projects to you and to be able to share that kind of information. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Desiree Martinez, and I attend the School of Business Management. And this question is for Jeff. I read that it takes six hours to get to the ISS. When you're launched, what are some things you do during your flight, and can you move around? For that six or so, it like, uh, used to be two days, and then in then two days we could we could get up out of our seats and, and spend some time in what we call the habitation module, uh, where we could uh, uh, eat um, and uh, take a couple of naps uh, during the journey here. But now we're doing a six-hour rendezvous. Uh, you do get a chance to get out of the seat, maybe not everybody does, but um, maybe one time uh, to take a break for uh, 10 or 15 minutes. But other than that, you're in your seat and you're doing a variety of orbital burns or, or firing of the main engine to adjust the orbit so that we set up our rendezvous uh, with the space station. So it's a, it's a pretty busy six hours. Thank you. Hello, my name is Zoe Romo from Duncanville High School and my question is for Tim. What is the most important research finding that you have discovered since being on the International Space Station? Hi Zoe, well you know we have about 250, in fact just a little bit more than 250 experiments uh, during Expedition 46 and 47. So uh, there's an awful lot of science going on. And the results of a lot of that science we won't know for a number of years to come yet uh, because we need to increase the number of, of experiments we run so that we have a good data set to draw conclusions from. Um, so it's very difficult to say what are the immediate conclusions of the science that I've been doing on board the space station. What I can tell you is what I've noticed in my own body and of course of about 30 experiments I'm doing just on, my, on myself as uh, human life science experiments. And it's very easy to notice the physical changes in the first two weeks of coming to space, a very immediate change of body shift of fluids, 
fluids up to the cheek, very puffy face. I felt very full headed, like I had a blocked up nose, uh, increased intracranial pressure. And uh, you notice straight away that your, your blood pressure drops, your heart rate drops, and your body goes through this uh, incredible change and acclimatization to space flight. As Jeff mentioned earlier, our muscles atrophy, our bone atrophies, and uh, slowly over time also in some astronauts our eyesight changes as well. And so it's incredible to notice all of these changes. In many ways it's remarkable how efficient and how effective the human body is at adapting to new environments. Of course, on the downside is we have to readapt to come back to planet Earth and the 1G environment uh, for myself in about eight weeks' time. Thank you. Hello. My name is Jose Ballon, and I'm from Grand Prairie Collegiate Institute. And this question is for Jeff. What kind of education and training did you go through to reach the position you are in today? If you go across the Corps of Astronauts, uh, uh, about half of them are military. I'm military, and I've got an um, a education in engineering, and uh, most of us uh, have education in engineering. But then there, uh, the other half of the core, historically, of U.S. astronauts have had uh, education in different sciences or medical doctors or even a few educators, uh, school teachers. Uh, so uh, we've, we've got representation from across the technical and, and engineering and scientific spectrum. Uh, those uh, educational uh, fields give you the background uh, to at least to make you eligible for the job. Thank you. Hi, I'm Beijing Duan, and this question is for Tim. What is the protocol for someone who becomes ill or injured on the spacecraft? A really good question and one that's obviously taken very seriously and it really depends on the urgency of the situation. If it's something fairly minor, then we'll consult with our flight surgeon um, and we'll be able to treat whatever it is. We have a number of um, medications on board that we can use. We're also uh, quite highly trained uh, in, uh, in terms of first aid and we're able to respond to a number of different situations up here. But with the help of our flight surgeon teams on the ground, in mission control, we would be able to treat a number of different situations to, to quite a high level. Um, if you notch it up one stage and something was really serious, then of course uh, the program could even consider returning a crew member back to planet Earth. Uh, we, we have our Soyuz spacecraft remain docked with us for the entire duration of our six-month mission. And should that crew of three need to go back to Earth for any reason, then they could always utilize that option. Thank you. Hi, I'm Clyde Swan, and my question is for Jeff. What is the best possible advice that you can give a person? Well, uh, I guess I would say to explore your interest and, um, and uh, develop your interest and work hard and study hard and all those things that you hear all the time. Um, but everybody has a different uh, slant on things, a different uh, um, um, interest uh, that develop into passions. Um, and if you work hard and develop those passions, figure out what they are um, while you maintain a balanced life, you know, with family and friends and whatnot and sports and other activities. Uh, doors will open uh, and you enter those doors to, uh, to take advantage of of those things and pursue those passions. So that's, that's I guess, would be the, in general what the advice I would give you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ben Mackey. I'm the principal of the School for the Talented and Gifted here. We thank you for being on with us. We're told you have one minute left. Is there anything else you all would like to say to our wonderful students, faculty, and all the guests that we have here today? I know you're in a magnet school there, and so I want to. I know that the, that the students are selected for the programs there. I want to congratulate them on their achievement and being selected for the programs there. Uh, I've been very impressed with uh, what I've read about the the program that you have there, um, in the in the that covers the Dallas area. 
so uh, I would can encourage the students to continue working hard and, as I said earlier, pursue uh, the passions as they develop. I also want to uh, take a moment to thank the educators and the staff that are present there. My father was a school teacher for almost 40 years. Uh, so I know what the investment uh, means to uh, to people. I, I often hear from folks uh, uh, the, the impact that my father made in people's lives. So uh, I know that you're impacting lives. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. Good luck with the rest of your mission. We'll see you on Earth soon. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event.